All right. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark 12. And I realize some of you may be using a tablet or a phone for that, and that is perfectly okay. Because we're going to be talking about this morning about the things that you're holding in your hands, technology and media. And, um, and I want to state from the very beginning that, and I, I brought with me several things that are mine that I use, and I've got my computers, got my iPad, got my new favorite mug, I don't need Google, my father knows everything, my kids got me that for Father's Day, that's my favorite one now. But I've got my phone, my iPad, my, my laptop, my screens that I use, we use technology all the time here, so as we're going to talk about technology and media and those things, I want to state from the very beginning, I'm not opposed to technology. I'm very thankful for it. I love the fact that we're in soccer camp and, and I can be up on the hill and I can check a weather report to see, hey, are we going to need to get kids off the hill because of a storm coming in? Um, I, I love the fact that we are live streaming and we're able to use media resources such as that to, to, to get the, the gospel message out, that we have our, our, our website, we have a, an app that is soon coming. Um, I love being able to communicate with missionaries all around the world through email or through Skype, um, being able to read books online. And so media and technology is a, can be a great tool. Social media can be a great tool that we use. We, we're promoting, we promote soccer camp and those things. We use social media ads to, to, to buy ad space and different things that we use out there. They can be a great tool. But what I do want you to see is that technology and social media is also a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways. It can be a great tool and, and have great things that are helpful in that, but also can accomplish in the wrong hands much evil. And so I would, I would liken it to nuclear technology. Nuclear technology, if used appropriately and rightly, is incredibly powerful. It gives us it gives us uh, um, all of our electricity in much of our country and is so useful. It can be used to, do, to treat illnesses and, and medical treatments and medical radiology. But if it malfunctions, radiology and, uh, and radiation, it can destroy whole cities and incapacitate people who are exposed to the radioactivity. Just uh, in the United States alone, as of December of 2017, there are 99 operating nuclear reactors in 61 nuclear power plants in the United States. We are using regularly that kind of power. In Palo Verde, the largest nuclear plant in the United States, it puts out just under 4,000 megawatts per hour, has the capability to put out that much power. An incredible, useful tool. But we've all remember, we remember back in March of 2000. There. See, I told you it can be a dangerous thing as well. Back in 2011, in March, the world watched as the nuclear power plant in Fukushima, Japan, melted down after an earthquake and tsunami hit there, and the foundation was. Uh, was cracked and then they had nuclear reactors over over boiling and problems there and they had to evacuate tons and tons of people as that uh, caused a massive problem there then we saw the, the the most massive destructive one was Chernobyl back in 1986 uh, in Ukraine when a sudden surge in power during a reactor systems test actually resulted in an explosion and caused radioactivity and radioactive um, um, uh, chemicals to go out throughout the air and they had to uh, evacuate approximately 220,000 people. Several employees in the plant died uh, and then several other uh, first responders were killed as they were trying to respond to the scene and so well over 30 that were killed in the actual disaster but then as weeks and months went on there were scores and scores more that were hospitalized and that were killed because of the, the, over, um, the, the acute radiation sickness that they had experienced from 
uh, what happened there at Chernobyl. And so it can be an incredibly deadly, deadly thing. The radiation contamination has taken decades there in Chernobyl to be even safe for people to go back into the area at all. And that's the danger. And so as we think about media and technology, we think of that double-edged sword. It can be a great tool. And we're in a society that we are almost dependent on that. Uh, we can't hardly think about life without internet or without phones and smartphones and those technology computers and things that we use today. That's our society and it can be a great tool. And so what I want you to get from this message this morning is that media and technology are tools that you need to rule over or they will rule over you. And parents and grandparents, we need to consider as well how much of this stuff we are placing directly into the hands of our kids without having some cautions that we think through and process through as we do so. So actually, I wrote this message to speak at camp, and I delivered it at camp, and I thought to myself, you know, this is an area that isn't just affecting just teenagers at camp. This is an area that is affecting all ages. And so I wanted to speak it to you guys this morning as well. This is something that we've got to put some serious thought on. Is how much am I ruling over my technology and my social media? How much time am I spending in Facebook and, and Instagram and, and those things? How much Snapchat time am I spending? And I know that even for, I've heard some testimonies this summer for teenagers to leave that, to go to a camp, has been a very difficult thing for some this summer. For some of them, their Snapchat streaks. I, I heard of some kids who did not go to camp because they were afraid of losing their Snapchat streak, where they are Snapchatting somebody every day. I heard some others that gave their accounts to somebody else so that while they were there and they couldn't have access to their technology, that somebody else would keep their streak alive. And so this is just, the, this is the environment that we live in. This is how it is. And so in an average American home, we are surrounded by screens, TVs, tablets, phones, digital, dis digital displays. The average American home today has more televisions in it, in it than it does people or toilets. Now that tells us something. We have we have changed in our world today when we think we need more screens and televisions than we do toilets. George Barna, I think, was correct when he said media exposure has become America's most widespread and serious addiction. We have become so gripped by it. The average American teenager or child is spending over just 53 hours a week in front of screen time, whether it's televisions or on social media or those things. They spend another 32 hours with earbuds in listening to music or, or just listening to music per week. That means that on average they're going to spend more time in front of a screen, whether it's social media, whether it's television, whether it's video games, they're going to spend more time in front of a screen than they will have by the time they graduate have spent in a classroom. That is the amount of impact that this technology and social media is having when you figure that we want our kids to be educated, want them to, to learn, and yet they are getting as much or more time in front of these things as they are in a classroom. So how much thought and forethought and care are we taking into saying, hey, I need to be cautious, how am I using this? How is it being controlled in my life so that I can use it as a tool that I rule over and not as, a, as, a, as an enemy that is ruling over me? And so we're going to work this through this morning. And what I want to do is to look at some scripture that we looked at a little bit earlier to see an important principle that affects deeply our, our tech and our media. And then I want to ask some questions, some penetrating questions. Serious questions to say, okay, let's, let's evaluate some things, and then I want to give a challenge at the end. And so let's pray together, and then we'll walk this through uh, together. Father, I pray that you would help uh, this message to be clear. God, I believe this is an area of serious concern, um, that media and technology has 
a, a place in our lives, and it has a very strong place in our lives, and to have some caution with that, to have some care, to say, how am I going to use this? How much time am I going to allow to be spent in video games? What kind of stuff am I going to watch on movies? How much time am I going to spend in virtual worlds compared into the real world? And so, God, I pray that you would help us to be open and receptive to your truth. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives, that you'd continue to mold us, to conform us to the image of your dear Son as we think about this and apply it to our lives. God, we thank you so much that we can be called your children. And we want to please you. We want to do right. And so I pray that you'd guide me to say what you'd have me to say this morning for your glory's sake. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, first I want us to start out with then is two profound commandments. Uh, ben read them for us earlier, but they're found in Mark 12. And um, we're going to see specifically in verses 28 to 31. Now, Jesus is in Jerusalem at this point, And one of the religious scribes comes to him. The scribes were, the, were kind of like the lawyers of the law, the teachers there of the law. They kept every detail. And one of them comes to him and asks Jesus, which is the first commandment, the first of all the commandments. And, and basically when he says the first there, it's speaking of first in rank, the highest commandment. What is most important? What is it that is the greatest thing that God desires of us? Well, that's a great question. It's a great question. We ought to say, well, yes, I want to know. What is that greatest thing that God desires of us? Well, here it is. Jesus responds by quoting out of Deuteronomy 6, a passage they would well know. They, quote it, they would quote it every day in the synagogues and the temple called the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. He says, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment commandment let's stop there for a second so basically he's saying true christians are to love god is a defining characteristic that we're to love god but notice he wants wholehearted devotion he doesn't say the greatest commandment is to love god with some of your heart with some of your mind some of your strength he doesn't say that it is all 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 of your heart the heart in the Hebrew understanding is the core of a person's identity. All of who you are, God wants and deserves all of you. A wholehearted love devotion to Him. And that's where this begins. And so He says, I, I, I want you to love God with all of your heart. I want you to, to love God with all of your soul. The soul would be the suke, the, the seat of your emotions. To emotionally pursue and love God. And not only the, all of your heart with all of your emotions, but all of your mind. I want your attention. I want you to think on me. I want you to pursue me mentally. I want you to love me with all of your strength. All of us. We need Christians today that are going to commit to being all in. I think we have so many times today Christianity that's kind of like, well, I'm partially in. I'll go along with this. This is fun, and, and I'll be there at church, and I'll fill up you on Sunday morning, and that, that's good. That fits my, that fits my Christian checkbox. When I was in college, I, I took up surfing, began to surf a lot, probably more than I, more than I should have. And I had a couple boards, and I would take guys out. One of the things that I learned surfing on the coast is when it would be storm-driven, there would be waves that would drive the, the, or wind that would drive the waves up, is that if you're going to surf, you had to get out past the break. And so I'd take guys out, and I'd say, okay, I'm going to give you a couple quick tips. The rest of it I'm going to give you once you get out there. If you're going to get out past the break, because in here you're going to get crashed on, and these waves aren't going to stop. It doesn't get smooth, let you swim out and paddle out and then get out to the break and ride them in. It's going to keep on crashing. So you're going to have to go at it all in. And I'd teach them how to duck dive under waves. I'd teach them how to paddle ride on it. And I'd say, now I'm going to get out there. And I'll wait for you out there. And then I'll teach you how to get up and how to ride them. 
But if you want to surf, you got to go all at it. you got to be all in. Because if you don't go all in, you're going to sit in here and you're going to paddle around and you're just going to get crashed and crashed and crashed. And you're not going to make it out. And you're going to waste my time trying to teach you all the rest of it. So if you want in on this, you better give it all you got. And that's why I learned, man, with surfing, you have to get out there and punch through the waves and just keep on fighting. They'd crash on you and push you back in and you just keep on swimming and fighting back out. And that's what I've learned in Christianity is that we don't have time for just a, I'm going to paddle around on the inside here and I'll paddle a little bit and then I'll get crashed on and then I'll go around a little bit more. No, no, that's not the purpose. That's not the objective. God wants all of us. And he says, I want you to go at me with all of your mind, all of your strength, all of your heart, all of your soul. I want you to be in. So are you in? Are you giving God all? He says, this is the greatest commandment of all, that we love him completely. And that love for God then ought to motivate how I use my media, how I interact with things that God loves or hates, how I respond to to gaming and video game violence, to sex outside of marriage, internet pornography, sending inappropriate text messages, vulgarity, uh, disrespect, all of those things that are out there, it ought to affect, how do, I, how do I consume this? How do I take this and, and, and I make sure it's not consuming me? And on the flip side, it ought to give me a love for God's Word. A love to serve Him. A love for God's people and church to be faithful and get involved. A love for worshiping God. That's what a wholehearted commitment is. We're going to look at that further in a moment, but notice something interesting. Jesus adds to it. The guy only asks for what the greatest commandment is, and he says, and the second, verse 31, like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. He he quotes from Leviticus 19, and he links these two. A genuine love for God is going to involve a genuine love for others. And 1 John 4.20 says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So the question that, as it relates to our technology and social media is this, does the technology I use and the social media that I'm on, does it help me love God with all my heart, with all my strength, with all my soul, with all my mind? And does it help me have a loving relationship with people? Does that help me do what Jesus is saying here, or does it hinder that? And so it goes back to the statement I said earlier. It's a double-edged sword. It's a tool that either you will rule over, or it will rule over you. So what I want to do now is I want to ask, four penetrating questions i want to ask some questions and let's evaluate how am i using my technology and social media and again i want to point to that i've got this stuff here because i use it i've got an ipad mini built into my pulpit i'm not opposed to technology i'm not opposed to social media i am for that if used appropriately but what i want to ask now is Ask some questions as it relates to technology that you use, such as TVs, tablets, smartphones, computers, and the media that you consume, such as movies, music, Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, all of those things. And I'm going to give you four evaluating questions that have to do with, does the media I consume, dot, 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 and when I say the media I consume, I, I want to encapsulate all those things, the, all the technology and all of the media in that question. And so you can kind of put in the ones that you use in that question. Okay, so we're going to ask four questions and work that through. First of all, does the media I consume help me meditate on God or distract me? Does the media that I consume help me to meditate on God or distract me? C.S. Lewis, in his work, The Screwtape Letters, he describes a man who goes into a library to read and to meditate on God. 
His mind is suddenly open to deep thoughts of God. Confronted with his own standing before God, he starts thinking in terms of his eternal welfare. Then, Lewis says, the demons that are assigned to keep him from discovering truth call his attention to the sounds on the street, to the newsboy calling out the latest news, and the fact that he is hungry, ready for lunch. And that's all that it takes. All thoughts of God disappear, and he is involved in the mundane affairs of life. And from the point of view of the satanic emissaries, he is delivered from this danger of thinking about God. Now, it's not necessarily today always the sounds on the streets or the newsboy calling it the latest news, but it's the pinging of my iPad with a, with a text that just came in or a, a streak that just came through or whatever it might be, and we have a hard time stopping and silencing things to meditate on God. It's, they can become very distracting. And so the fear that I have is that our technology and media are now the tool that Satan is using to keep us from having serious time with God and truly meditating on Him and thinking about His Word. And so I want you to think the different, through two words. I want us to think about these two words and the differences of. The first one is the word meditate. In Psalm 19, 14, David says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is a man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So the word meditate there is a word that thinks, it is a word that means to, to continue to ponder over, to chew on, to think about. And, and the Bible is telling us that blessed is the man who's meditating on God and his word. He shall prosper. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and everything he does will prosper because he's meditating on God. We are called to do that. The second word I want you to think about is the word amuse. It's a two-part word. The, the, The core of the word is the word muse. It means to think, to think about. But it's preceded by the alpha negative, the uh, which means to not. So amuse means to not think. When you go to an amusement park, it's all about not thinking. You don't go there to say, boy, I want to really deeply think over some scripture, or I want to, you know, I'm, I'm studying for a, this hard test at school, so I'm going to go to the amusement park. No, that's not where you go. You go to the amusement park because it's about not thinking. You want to ride the ride. You just want to feel the rush. And we are so full of amusement. There are so many things that are amusing to us that are causing us not to think. And so we fill our times, our time and our minds with noise. Noise. We we wake up and we put in earbuds to listen to music. We jump right on Facebook to to clear away, or, or right away to hear the noise of all that's going on. Uh, we tune in the TV to see what's going on in the, the news, what took place around the world. Uh, we, we can't ride in a car today without listening to music. Uh, we are so accustomed, there's got to be noise, that as soon as we step in the car and drive, we've got to turn on the radio or put on a CD or something because I've got to have noise playing. And we have eliminated the options and the opportunities just to be quiet and to talk with God and to meditate on His Word. And so... We are so distracted from all those things. I think Neil Postman had it correct in his book entitled, Amusing Ourselves to Death. I think he's correct. We are amusing ourselves to death. And we're starting this from infancy. Uh, We we, we talk about situations such as ADD and, and being distracted in kids in classrooms today. Do you realize there's a reason behind that? I came across an interesting study a study by Dr. Dimitri Christakis. He's a professor of pediatrics and the director of the Center of the Children's Health at Seattle Children's Hospital. And they studied the development of the newborn's brain, which he says triples in size in the first two years. So this newborn's brain, it is quickly growing. There's the newborn's brain. In two years, it's going to triple in size. And they said 
it is greatly impacted by the exposure to the life around it. And they found this, that babies who were placed in front of repeated and hours of fast-paced television and media that changes every six seconds. If you watch a television screen, you'll notice they don't leave a screen picture up for very long. It's changing constantly. They said they developed shorter attention spans. And the reality of life seems boring to them as they grow up. In contrast to that, those who were given cognitive stimulation, such as being read to, playing games, taking walks, doing exercise, it helped them to develop longer and more focused attention spans. Now, I say that, and I bring that up for two reasons. One, because many of us have young children in here. That ought to cause us to stop and say, wait a minute, how much time am I just plug in my kid in front of a screen. I know that's an easy babysitter, but is that the best thing for them? Because it's affecting their ability to sit then later on in a classroom and to think deeply on things. Why is it that people struggle sitting through a 45-minute sermon today? We have become so used to a fast-paced environment that to sit still and meditate and think is so hard. And so I believe that we are conditioning ourselves even today, even as we're older, we're conditioning our minds that we are so used to fast paced. Everything is happening so fast that the that the real world outside of the virtual world seems too slow. And we have a hard time just being to sit back and enjoy it. Hey, listen, go for a walk. Turn off the radio. And, and, and drink in the majesty of God's creation. Start memorizing some scripture. Put them down on a three by five card and stick them in your pocket. Laminate them like I've got and I've got them in my shower. Memorize scripture. Put them on your mirror when you're getting ready for the morning. Put them in your car. You don't have to listen to the radio. You can actually meditate on scripture there. In his sermon in, out of Psalm 62 verse 1, Entitled, For God Alone, My Soul Waits in Silence, Diedrich Bonhoeffer took time to explain the modern fear of silence and to show how modern man is avoided by media, a phenomenon operating in the late 1920s in Germany. And here's some things he said in that sermon. He said, I know that's small letters there. He said, we flee silence. We race from activity to activity to avoid having to be alone with ourselves for even a moment, to avoid having to look at ourselves in the mirror. We use the noise of media in our lives to drown out the things we'd rather not face. Not only are we afraid of ourselves, of discovering and unmasking ourselves, but even more we are afraid of God, that He might disturb our aloneness and discover and unmask us, that God might draw us into partnership and do with us whatever He wants wants that's in the 1920s Diedrich Bonhoeffer says that this media is already starting to distract us and we fear silence because we don't want to actually evaluate ourselves and we don't want God to really speak to us boy how telling that is back in the 1920s almost a century ago and think how much more is just streaming into our lives at such a fast pace and so again it comes back to this question of does the media that I consume does it help me meditate on God or does it distract me does it help me as we thought about that first commandment does it help me love the Lord my God with all my with all my heart with all my strength with all my soul with all my mind does it help me do that repeatedly scripture encourages the silence before God Psalm 37, 3, rest or be silent in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Psalm 62, verse 5, my soul, wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. So there's the first evaluating question. Next question that we're going to ask is, does the media that I consume help me develop true loving relationships or shallow facades? And here's what I fear. I fear that if not kept in check, our online social media personas can cause two problems. Here's the problems that I fear they can cause. The first is narcissism. 
we can become so self-centered that everything is about me. And look what I'm doing. It's very narcissistic. The, the whole motto of YouTube, broadcast yourself. Everybody needs to see me. Let me post on Facebook so you can see my face and, and you can hear how I got up today at this time and I had Rice Krispie for breakfast and then I went and I went to my room and I saw this thing and, and, and we tell every little detail. It's narcissistic. Look at me, 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 me. And I fear that that's a dangerous thing for us today. That we are so self-focused. The second thing that I fear is that our media can cause surface level relationships that are shallow and empty and lead to loneliness. Vivek Murphy, who was the U.S. Surgeon General from 2014 to 2017, he stated insightfully that as he was practicing medicine, as a practicing physician, he saw loneliness as an increasing problem and he stated this. He said, it is a dangerous, it is a dangerous thing or it is dangerous to assume that online relationships are equivalent to offline relationships. The world is filled with people with hundreds of friends on Facebook and thousands of followers on Instagram who feel profoundly alone. So, if the second greatest question, or the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself... The question to ask with this is, does my media help me develop true loving relationships? Do I have 3,000 Facebook friends, but I couldn't tell you a single prayer request for them? Do I have 3,000 Facebook friends, but I don't feel I can call any of them up and say, hey, can you come over and sit with me? I'm struggling through some things. Can we talk? We have developed a facade, surface level relationships, and the result of that is incredible loneliness. We don't know how to have a conversation with someone. We sit at a table and we all talk with our thumbs to one another. Instead of talking across the table face to face where I can see your eyes and I can hear the compassion in your voice. And so we have, we have just gotten such in a world of isolation. We have smart devices. We have automated tellers and so we don't have to actually talk to anybody Online shopping. I, I heard of a friend of mine the other day that he even buys his potato chips and ships them from to his house on Amazon. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. And so he orders his snacks from his computer in his room and they ship him his potato chips right to his room. We have become so isolated. We live in a society today where we, we drive into our houses, we, we pull up the garage door, we go in, we close the garage door, and we walk into our house. We don't talk to neighbors. We don't talk to people around us. We, we go to, to places, and even now at McDonald's, they don't even want you to talk to the person behind the counter. They want you to order your stuff online to a computer. We live in a world of isolation, and we've got to be very cautious with that, that we don't take that to the extreme. We have to intentionally then pursue, I want to love my neighbor as myself. I want to know deeply, how are you doing today? You doing okay? And I can pray for? Hey, what's going on in your life? Hey, how's your family? How's this going on? And I think sometimes we get the general knowledge just from the surface level off of uh, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter tweets or whatever that might be, and we have become lonely. In fact, British Prime Minister Theresa May recently appointed a minister of loneliness to begin to deal with this epidemic. When Alexander Graham Bell introduced the telephone, skeptics worried about how it might affect people's interactions. Now I would say that the, the, the concern that I have is texting. We don't even pick up a phone anymore to talk. We talk through our thumbs. We are mashing out in the United States on a daily basis five billion text messages and that's not to mention the several billion more that are going out or six billion text messages i'm sorry not to mention a likely few billion more on whatsapp and facebook messenger and those things our communication with is with our thumbs the problem is is you don't get to hear my tone of voice a am i happy with you when i just did all caps does that mean i'm yelling at you and i'm angry does that emoji that has tears running down, does that mean I'm really sad? Uh, we don't get the depth. We don't get to see in their eyes. Sometimes we have communications. I get text messages and finally I'll say, hey, I, we just need to sit down. 
Uh, we need to sit down and talk. I want you to, if we're going to talk this situation through, I want you to see my eyes. I want you to hear my voice, that I care, and I can't get that across in a text message. And so it's, it's studies show that it's causing friction in relationships because there's that confusion. And so it's hard to interpret those things. In addition, it stops us from really getting deep. We don't deal with the hard stuff. We aren't, we aren't asking somebody about things that are difficult. But God made us for fellowship. That's why in Genesis 2.18 it says, It's not good that a man should be alone. And then God developed the, the, the marriage and family relationship. And then He's given us the relationships in, in society today. And He's given us the, 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 the church, the family, the saints. A recent feature article published in the Atlantic entitled, Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation, stated this. The more, times teen, the more time teens spend looking at screens, the more likely they are to report symptoms of depression. And girls have borne the brunt of the rise in depressive symptoms among today's teens. For boys, depressive symptoms rose 21% from 2012 to 2015. In the same span, rates among girls increased by 50%. The rates of suicide for both increased too. Male suicides doubled and female suicides tripled. That makes me question, is this helping me have deep, meaningful relationships that are fulfilling? Or is this making me lonely and depressed? Now again, I'm not opposed to this. I was thankful yesterday that I could get texts from Tyler and he's saying, hey, we're not there. The baby hasn't come yet. Later on, he sends me a picture and shows me the baby has come. Man, I, I'm thankful for, for those things because it wasn't the time for me to call him when he's in the delivery room, right? I, I don't want to be there at that time. So I'm not saying, again, that these things are wrong. I'm not getting rid of my tech. I'm going to use this stuff. But is it helping me? Am I ruling over it? Or is it ruling over me? And so there's question number two. Question number three. Does the media that I consume influence me towards holiness or sinfulness? There's a lot of stuff that comes through. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 15 states, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, As in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And the fear is that we can become easily desensitized to media over time. The sexual perversions, the disrespect, the crudeness, the violence is something that is prevalent in media today. Whether it's movies we watch, songs we listen to, if it's video games, and Peter warns us to, to gird up the loins, be ready, as, as the idea there is as they would gird up. They, they ran to that, those days with robes, and they would have to, to pull them up so they could run hard and be swift. He says, hey, gird up the loins, but of your mind. Be ready to be, to be active about it, to be uh, volitional and methodical and planned out. Be ready to run this race hard. Why? We well, says later on, because your adversary, the devil, seeks, roams about seeking whom he may devour. And he's using your mind to do it today. There's a lot of influence that is coming in. Both the American Psychological Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics takes a firm stance against children and teens playing violent video games. They report that They report that 85% or more of video games on the market contain some form of violence. We have become desensitized to violence and its effects, and it affects our reaction to people and obviously our love for our neighbors as ourselves. The American Psychological Association observed in August, in an August 2015 policy statement, that research demonstrated a link between violent video game use and both increases in aggressive behavior and decreases in pro-social behavior, empathy, and moral engagement. So is that media then helping me to love my neighbor as myself? In fact, I found it interesting. In World War II, 
when U.S. soldiers had a clear shot at the enemy, you know what the rate was that actually took the shot? One out of every five. Only 20% when they had a clear shot at the enemy would actually take the shot. And it wasn't because they were cowards or they were, they were afraid. They actually, they, they actually were the ones that would run out into a battlefield to rescue a friend with bullets flying past them. But it's because they valued life. And they saw the enemy as a life. And, and in fact, it goes back even further than that. It goes back to the Civil War era, era when they were gathering up muskets from the Battle of Gettysburg. They found that the muskets that they, that they gathered up that were on the battlefield, they found that uh, 95 percent, I'm sorry, only 5 percent had been shot. 95 percent of the muskets had never been fired, and they found that many of them had been loaded several times. So guys were pick up their musket, acting like they fired, they would get out another ball and another sh- all that stuff, and they would reload the musket again, making it look like they're firing, and they were loaded multiple times, but had never fired the initial shot. They valued life. They were more willing to have their life be taken than to take someone else's life. And the military began to recognize this and said, man, we've got a problem in their eyes as a military. How are we going to get them to, to not think this way? And what they recognized is that they had been practicing on firing ranges with just regular circular targets. And so they were advised they were advised then um, by psychologists to change their, their, their training practices, to revolutionize their training. And one of the key changes was to get rid of those old firing ranges and to put in, at that time, it was to put in um, uh, uh, human silhouettes. Now them start firing at human silhouettes, which they began to do. By the, by the Korean War, research suggests that 55% of U.S. soldiers now fire on the enemy. They continued, in fact, they continued to, to use those silhouettes, and then they started putting faces on them. And by Vietnam, the rate climbed to more than 90%. And then they started using lifelike targets. They had targets that, that were 3D or looked like a human being. Look, they were dressed in clothes, had a face like In fact, they even, in the, sometimes the military today, will take cabbages hollow them out fill them with ketchup so when you shoot it looks like a head exploding and blood coming out but then what they went to beyond that is they began to use they they began to use um 3d um and and cyber or video simulations that you would go in and they would hook you up and you see the guy in the bottom he's hooked up to stuff and he is in a simulation where he is firing on people and it's completely lifelike and you get reward points for every successful shot. Now the military says they have soldiers that think nothing of taking a life and then go and order a pizza and having a drink with the guys. Life has become so devalued. We've become so desensitized to life and to things and the video games have brought that around in the violence. You, you might be saying, ah, you're overreacting. Oh, I thought I had it there. I'm sorry. You may be thinking, ah, you're overreacting about this stuff. When I play video games, I'm not thinking about going out and shooting somebody or taking an AR into a school setting or going downtown and, and shooting somebody. But listen to what Jesus or God says in Psalm 11, verse, 5, 11, verse 5. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. God is totally against violence because he created and loves people. God is totally against sexual perversion that uses women for provocative and inappropriate means because he loves people. In both Jeremiah 6.15 and in 8.12, God says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed nor do they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall at the time I punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. Do you blush? Does it bother you when you see sexual scenes or women on a screen immodestly dressed? Does it cause you to blush when you you hear curse words on the screen today? Does it cause you to blush when you see senseless violence to people? 
That doesn't even begin to scratch the surface, really, of, of the influences that are out there dealing with pornography and those things. The amount of filth that can come through. 35% of all internet downloads are related to pornography. And 40 million Americans are regularly viewing porn. And what's so stunning is it's, it's concealable. You, you can carry it around on your smart device. You can hide it. Nobody would know. It's personal. It's private today. There is great danger. These are, these are great tools. But they can also be very powerfully used for negative influences. And so we don't have time to look at more of that. But my question again is, does your media and your tech, is it influencing you towards holiness? What kind of influence does it have on your life? Fourth question, does the media I consume help me to be productive or does it enslave me? I came across an interesting study by Dr. Jeff Myers of Summit Ministries who explained that when someone is given a task, that they are having to do something or figure something out, it stimulates a part of the brain that is this front area, and they have a technical term called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So when you're given a task, you're playing a game, or you've got a job to do, that stimulates that, that dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and that part of the brain gets flooded with, with blood so it can, it can produce and it can, it can be productive. And then as it does, as you figure it out and you produce, what it does then is they found that it, it triggers, and there's not actually a, a black hole in your brain. I know some of you think there might be in some people in your, in your families, but there isn't a black hole. This is just symbolizing it. This is called the nucleus incumbens. The nucleus incumbens is the, is the pleasure center that's in your brain. It's when the front area is being stimulated and your brain is saying, hey, work hard, you're producing something. It stimulates the nucleus incumbens, which is a pleasure sensor, sensor that tells your body, yes, this is great. And it sends out chemicals throughout your body saying, man, isn't this great? Look what we've accomplished. Look what we've done. But what they found in studies now is that when people are involved in the virtual world, whether it's watching a movie, playing video games, or any of that stuff, what it does is it actually steals blood from the front area. It actually drains the blood from that, that dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, but yet it still stimulates the nucleus incumbents. So your brain is being told, hey, we did something, when you did actually nothing at all. And so we have become productive in the virtual world, but we don't know how to operate in the real world. And then when we recognize that I can't, I'm not producing the real world, it drives us back into the virtual world over and over again. And so he was asked in his, uh, Dr. Jeff Myers, he says, in other words, your brain is being conditioned to sense accomplishment when in fact you've done nothing. It's actually the exact same reaction to when you smoke crack. The nucleus incumbent says, great, we're doing something. And it's actually stealing blood from the rest of your body and causing damage, and you've done nothing. And so he asks the question, he says, when I'm asked why so many young men are passive, his answer is very simple. We've arranged the culture through media to trick their brains into thinking they've done something when in fact they haven't. And so we don't know how to operate in the real world and all of our accomplishments are in the virtual world. And so does the media I consume help me to be productive or is it enslaving me? Again, technology and media have great potential, but they can eat up a lot of time. Oh man, they can eat up a powerful lot of time. I read of an older lady, and um, I won't give the age, but an older lady who was stuck playing a video game called Farmville, where you develop a virtual farm. And you plant crops in these areas, and you have to wait a certain amount of time as they grow, and then you, you, grant, you, you, you collect the crops and those things, and you sell it off. And this lady was so addicted that she was spending hours a day on Farmville. She actually had figured out that she could set up false emails and set up false accounts, and those people could give her uh, crops and give her money towards her farm. She was cheating the system. This older lady was playing Farmville, and she was cheating the system. And she was playing Farmville hours a day up in this massive farm. And she had to always check, oh, it's time to, to glean this crop here or whatever. 
Then she finally got sick and was, had to stay away from it for several weeks. She couldn't get out of bed and couldn't do her stuff. And after she got better, she went upstairs to her room to open the laptop and play this game. And she thought to herself, why am I going to do this? Why don't I go outside and actually plant some flowers? Actually work with my own hands in the dirt. And so she did. She closed the laptop, ended her account, and began getting to gardening and flowering. She said, man, it is so rewarding. I love seeing what I produce in the real world. And it had me enslaved in the virtual world. And we have such a society today that is enslaved in that way. That's why Paul says, redeem the time. Or he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, at all, as well, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All th- things are, are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, technology is not evil. In fact, I think it's actually, uh, it's actually the development of technology, I think it is a good thing. It is actually the result of man doing what we were created to do, to produce, to create. Uh, they, these are great things that we've got. We're able to, to produce things and expand and, and grow. But they could also become very enslaving if not careful with them, if not cautious. And so that's why Hebrews 12 says, he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith so there's four questions to help us evaluate am i ruling over my tech and my media or is it ruling over me is it helping me to do these two great commands to love the lord my god with everything i have and to love my neighbor as myself then i want to give and finish out with this and really drive it home to us personally with a purposeful challenge Now, I did this to the teenagers, and I'm going to give it to you as well, because I think it's good for us. And I want you to challenge, or I want to challenge you to reflect on all this with a practical challenge of a two-week media fast. Now, I'm not saying that if you have to at work, get on the internet, that you don't do that, or that you don't call home and say, hey, hon, I'm getting ready to come home from work, you know, so you can be prepared. That's not the purpose of this. I don't want you to be enslaved by the fast, but it's the extra stuff. The movies, the music, the social media, all that stuff, to set it aside for two weeks. And the reason I'm asking that, the reason I'm pushing you to to take this step is for a couple purposes. I want you to use that two weeks purposefully. The first reason is I I want you to allow God to search you to see if there's any wicked way in you. That that he's that that Satan is using the media and technology to bring out sin in your life. So allow you to say, to, like, like the psalmist says in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Take that time to say, God, can you check me? I want to love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind. And I don't want to be disconnected because of sin. So can you check me? Is there things I need to make right with you and to make, and to make confession about? second reason I want you to do it is to give you some time to develop a practical strategy to make sure that you rule over your tech and it doesn't rule over you. So when you turn it back on and you're going to get back on Facebook or Instagram or, or start sending out tweets or whatever it is, you're going to start watching movies again uh, to think through, how am I going to make sure that I'm not consuming stuff that I shouldn't? How am I going to make sure that my kids aren't taking in on their tablets and their devices. Oh, what, kind of, what kind of accountability features am I going to have? I'll be honest with you. On every bit of tech that I have, you can go on my iPad, my laptop, my phone. I've got accountability software called Covenant Eyes. That I've got accountability partners that they know every place that I go and search. I've had it for like 15 years. Because I know that the heart is desperately wicked. And mine included. And so I know I want to put things, I don't want to let this stuff ever rule over me. And so take the time during this two weeks and say, hey, what things am I going to put in place for my kids? 
I was talking to somebody else today, I want to find out what the software is, that they've got a software in all their kids' phones that any text messages they receive or get, it's mirrored to their own phone. They see the communication that's being had. I think that's a great idea. Not that we're like over hawking over them, but to them, then they know there's accountability in place. It keeps you from going to those things. And so use that two weeks to say, I want to set up some, some blockades. The third reason I want you to do it is to give a little more time to resensitize you to God and to sin. So that when you turn back on a movie, you're like, whoa, I didn't realize all those curse words are in there. Or I even didn't even recognize all the, the sexual promiscuity that takes place out there. And man, I don't, I don't think this is good for us. We can get to the place where we don't even blush anymore. And to have some time away from it, and you come back, you're, it, it will astound you. So I'm going to give you a challenge. Will you set it aside? Will you set aside your, your TV, your movies, your social media, your music, your internet, your video games? And say, I want to make sure that this is a tool that I rule over. And it's not ruling over me. And so, this is where we are. I realize it's a lot to take in. I realize it's a lot this morning, but I'm not here to call us to casual Christianity and a giant race to the middle. I'm here to say, let's go for it. Let's redeem the time. Let's go hard after God. Let's love Him with all our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. Let's pursue each other. Let's develop deep relationships and love our neighbor as ourselves. And not paddle on the inside, getting crashed by the waves. Let's get out there and let's do it. Let's go for God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word and how it applies to our lives. Even as this was written, this, this account with Christ some 2,000 years ago. You know how it so much applies to us. And how there's this challenge of media and technology. God, help us to make sure that we use it as a tool for good. Lord, we don't allow Satan the opportunity to, to destroy lives. Because that's his heartbeat, that's his desire, is to destroy. So God, would you evaluate us right now? Would you help us to be honest with ourselves about our tech? about our media, and about the influence it has on our lives. The distraction it is for us being to meditate on you. And God, as we just spend a moment just quietly with you, I pray that you'd help us to respond appropriately to this message. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I also want to have just a, just a, a moment of silence, just for you just to pray and talk to the Lord. Ask him, God, do you want me to take this, do you want me to take this media fast? Do you want me to just take a step back for a couple weeks? Is there areas I need to maybe confess? I, I don't want to be consumed by my media. And so just take a moment here on your own. Father, thank you for this time together. May you be glorified through your people as we unite together and pursue you together with all of our being. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.